Thanks very much. So I was woken in the middle of the night by a thud on the hull of our boat. And when we rushed up on deck, we found that we were surrounded by pieces of plastic in the ocean. It didn't make any sense. We were over a thousand miles from land. The closest people to us were in the space station in orbit above our heads. And yet there was this evidence of human life and waste around us in one of the most remote parts of our planet. At this time, I was on a trip around the world by boat, a journey that started for me as a way to hitchhike from England to a new job as an architect in Australia. But it was this incident at sea that sparked a career change for me to now sail around the world on a mission to connect scientists and communicators with the ocean and studying issues all the way from the equator to the poles. Along the way, we have seen a lot of the changes that are happening in our oceans. We would stop at these small islands and find that the locals were struggling to catch fish because the commercial vessels had emptied their waters. They were struggling to grow food in the ground because the rising sea levels had caused their soil to become too salty. But the knock-on effect of this was a new reliance on packaged, imported food and drink that all comes wrapped up in this new, strange material, plastic. These paradise-like islands, down on the ground, it really is a different story. There is no waste system, nowhere for this plastic to go. It gets dumped on the beach, in the ocean, or burnt. And it was actually that burning smell, that really toxic smell that kept getting up my nose every island that we visited. And when I started researching what that smell was, I learned about these chemicals, dioxins, and how they lead to cancer, and how they disrupt our hormones and really chemicals that we don't want inside us. And so this became my first mission, to eliminate the burning of plastic on these two small islands in Tonga, in the South Pacific. It started with a shift in thinking. As I learned the Tongan language, I discovered that there was no word for rubbish bin. The concept of throwing something away into a controlled system didn't exist in their culture because up until very recently, it hadn't needed to. Organic matter can be thrown on the ground, no problem. So it's not only infrastructure that these small islands need, but a whole new way of thinking about this new inorganic material. So after six months of working with the local community and the government, we culminated in a colossal cleanup event. And together with 3,000 local volunteers, we picked up 56 tons of rubbish in just five hours. Now this amount of waste on the coastlines, it absolutely staggered me. But not only what was being produced locally, but every morning when I walked along the beach, I was seeing plastic washing up, often with writing on it in languages that I didn't even recognize. So this got me asking more questions. Where was that plastic coming from? And why was it ending up on these little Pacific islands? So I started to learn more about the way that we actually use plastic. This terrifyingly large number that's running before your eyes is the number of plastic bags that we're using right now. This clock started ticking on the 1st of January, 
2018. Those bags, they are used once, maybe twice, probably three times at best, and then they're thrown away. And why is it that we are using a material, plastic, that lasts forever to make a product that's designed to be used once and then thrown away? And it really is that mismatch of material science and product design that puts us in this situation of having all this waste material that no longer has any use or any value. But then I thought, can't we just recycle all that plastic? Can't we turn it back into new things? It turns out that only 9% of the plastic that we use actually gets recycled. And that number's so low because plastic is a term we give to hundreds of materials. They've got different properties and therefore different chemical structures. But to recycle something, we can only take one type of plastic at a time. So this mess here, it needs to be cleaned and sorted. And then you come across something like a toothbrush that's got three or four different types of plastic all stuck together into one object, making it impossible to recycle. So all this plastic with no place to go, we then start seeing much of it finding its way into streams and drains. So 8 million tons annually finds its way down into the ocean. From there, it meets ocean currents and moves around to end up in these accumulation zones or gyres. Now, back then, we still knew very little, really, about these gyres and actually what existed there. And so this became the next mission, to sail to these five subtropical oceanic gyres to find out, is there any plastic there? If so, how much? And ultimately, what can we do about it? So we set out into the middle of these gyres, expecting to find islands of plastic, but quickly realized that the plastic was a lot smaller than expected. The UV rays of the sun photodegrade the big bits into smaller fragments, what we call microplastics. So we had to put a net through the water to take a much closer look at what was floating on the surface, invisible to our human eye when we look at the water. And every time we pull that net back on board and turn it inside out, we find hundreds of these tiny fragments of plastic and also little fibers. And what we realize is that our ocean has become a fine soup of these microplastic particles. Over the following few years, we crisscrossed our way back and forth all over the planet, going to every one of these gyres, mostly for the first time. And everywhere we went, it was the same story. Plastic in every sample, but not only in the gyres, but all the way from the equator to the Arctic. Once we get the samples back on board, we then have to analyze them and try and work out what's plastic and what's plankton. I was shocked by how hard it was to distinguish between the two. And it made me wonder how a fish coped figuring out what was plastic and what was their food, the plankton. So we then started catching fish and finding plastic inside the stomachs of them as well. So at this point, the conversation changed. We were not just looking at the physical presence of plastic, but actually, if it was getting into the food chain, our food chain, then what might that mean for us chemically as well? So I decided I wanted to know, is this something that we even need to worry about? And I decided to have my own blood tested for these chemicals that are used in the production of plastic and other products. So working together with the United Nations, we chose 35 chemicals that are banned because they're toxic to humans and the environment. And of those 35 chemicals, we found 29 of them inside my body. Now this really changed things for me. 
And I think often when we're hearing about environmental problems, we're reading about something that's happening somewhere else to somebody else at some point in the future. But this made me realize that we all, I'm afraid all of us, have a chemical footprint, something that we will never get rid of. And at the moment, the levels of toxic chemical is not alarmingly high that we need to be immediately concerned about our health, but it's a scary indicator of the direction that we are heading. So this experiment for me actually triggered a whole new project, X Expedition, a series of all women's voyages around the world looking at plastics, toxics, and the impact on female health and the next generation. We've now completed nine of these voyages since 2014, and I'm excited to announce that the next voyage this summer will be sailing from Hawaii to here in Vancouver and then on to Seattle. And I look forward to working with some of you in the room on that project later this year. Now, these issues that I've been talking about, they are complex and call for a real wide range of solutions. But the more time I spend at sea, the more I realize that these solutions start here on land. Right now, there are five trillion fragments floating on the surface of our ocean. Many times more have sunk to the depths. We can't even measure them. This makes large-scale cleanup of the oceans an immense challenge. But we can tackle this problem at every point on the spectrum, from source to ocean, from product design to waste management. But to solve this problem long term, we need to turn off the tap. We need to work at the source. And this upstream action is required across all sectors of society. We need designers in industry. We need policymakers in government. And we need us all as consumers to make better choices. Recently, I've been working with an organization called Parley for the Oceans, implementing the air strategy, our approach to solutions, particularly with the private sector. Adidas and Corona are a couple of the first clients. And so the air strategy, it's all about avoid, intercept, redesign. Avoid is pretty straightforward. If you're not using the plastic in the first place, well, you've already solved the problem. Intercept. This is based on the fact that every piece of plastic that's ever been produced and used still exists somewhere on planet Earth. We have so much material already out there, there's really no need to be taking more oil from the ground to make more plastic. And finally, redesign. If we decide that we want to eliminate plastic from our lives, from our supply chains, we will probably get about 70% of the way there and then get really stuck. Because that final 30% is hard. We don't actually have the solutions yet for it. So this is why creating new, immater new materials and new ways of doing things is so important so that we can live waste-free lives. We do need to see government legislation of these solutions, but actually it's industry that needs to play a leading role in working out that bit of innovation. We have brought ourselves into this situation, but I really, really believe that we can invent our way out of it. One thing I love about being at sea is that you're constantly having to react to the changes in the environment around you. If the waves change direction or the wind picks up, you have to adjust your sails, you have to shift your course, and often your life depends on that response. Now, we invented plastics and these chemicals for good reasons. 
We didn't set out to destroy our ocean. It was millions of micro actions that have got us to where we are today. But now we know. We know the impact that we're having, and we also know many of the steps that we can take to solve it. And so it's time for us to respond, to adjust our sails, to shift our course as if our lives depend on it. Thank you. <laughs>